morning, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU CBA's special lecture series. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for International Business Education, often called the side using acronym at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. LMU is one of, <clears throat> excuse me, one of 16 universities in the country that received these prestigious cyber grants. The LMU side serves as regional as well as national resources to help US companies and industries enhance global competitiveness. To fulfill this mission, LMU side has been offering special lecture series on various topics of international business that have significant implications for US businesses. Today's webinar covers a very important and timely topic in this digital age. In fact, LNU side has adopted cybersecurity as a new theme to focus on during this grand cycle. As you all know, cyber, global cyber threat continues to increase at a rapid pace with a rising number of data breaches each year. Russia and China have been accused of their attack on cybersecurity in the US as information technology has become critical in competing in the global market, governments as well as companies should be proactive to protect digital data, transactions, and networks. Blockchain technology has increasingly become popular as it prevents any type of data breaches and cyber attacks. Any digital assets or transactions can be put into the blockchain to ensure that data remains private and secure. Today, we are very fortunate to have four experts who can educate us about this important topic. Before we start this program, let me introduce our Dean of this College of Business Administration, Dr. Dale Smith. She will greet you with a few words. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Professor Peck. And as Dean of the College and on behalf of the College of Business Administration here at LMU, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone for the Center for International Business Education and our Department of Info Systems and Business Analytics, or what we refer to as ISBA, to the webinar Cybersecurity and Blockchain in the Global Digital Age. As Professor Peck mentioned, we're certainly honored to have both academics and industry leaders who will share their expertise around a topic that is discussed globally and impacts business every single day. In fact, as recently as this morning, I was reading the Washington Post and it was all about a cybersecurity attack this morning that affected a handful of US airports in Atlanta, Chicago, New York, and here in Los Angeles. Fortunately, there was no effect on flight operations, but each of these leaders at these multiple airports had to notify FBI and TSA about a cyber attack that crashed their websites. While it was certainly more of a public nuisance than a serious security threat, it certainly took up public attention, mine included. Um, the Port Authority of New York shared that the Cyber City Defense System actually did its job by detecting the incident quickly and employing the kinds of protocols that restore services, allow uh, the business to investigate, and ensure that there were no operational disruptions. I'm sharing this story not only to indicate the recency and the presence of these concerns, but also to capture the essence of what we all study as business leaders or as students in business disciplines. At the heart of business, there's an interdependency related to corporate strategy, people, processes, and technology. And in the cyber digital age, where we're so very dependent on big data, the internet of things and blockchain, our vigilance and need for understanding and depth couldn't be greater. So as Professor Peck mentioned, tonight's panel will focus on the pressing cybersecurity challenges we face. And I have to say, not being my discipline, it obviously goes beyond protecting your password. Although I am reminded of a recent web surfing experience where I came across wisdom that still holds true. And to give a little bit of comic relief, um, which is tough to find these days reading the news, passwords are like underwear. Don't let people see it change it often, and you shouldn't share with strangers. Seriously though, we all know that the only constant with technology is the rapid rate of change and how we adapt as leaders in understanding cyber risks, reducing risks from the modern day threats, and ensuring privacy and security for our people, processes, systems, and the technology couldn't be more important. And our experts this evening will really provide some keen insight. You know, it's funny, um, I was in the EU just a few weeks ago, 
And we were talking in our very global group of deans and directors about how the EU has responded with a lot of regulation and guidance on business practice. We're certainly seeing uh, the world catching up, and I'm sure our experts will share examples of that. But technology is changing that landscape daily. And make no mistake, businesses are going to have to address these demands from customers, consumers, and regulators far beyond just changing passwords and, and issues around privacy. The statistics differ, and I'm sure our experts will share them, but the latest statistic that I came across indicated that over 60% of our organizations experienced a jump of 25% or more in cyber threats or alerts just since the start of COVID. The need to see cybersecurity and use of technology as a comparative advantage for our organizations has got to be mission critical in order to survive and indeed thrive. So let me uh, end my remarks and turn it over to the chair by just sharing some, some comments that uh, Stefan Napo, who's a vice president and a global chief information security officer, that he won the CISO of the year in, in 2018, it's from the EU and he framed the issue in this way. He shared that the five most efficient cyber defenders are anticipation, education, detection, reaction, and resilience. Do remember, he wrote, that cybersecurity is so much more than just an IT topic. So in the spirit of what NAPO called anticipation and education, and to help us all be prepared, I know that we're looking forward to tonight's discussion. It is now my distinct honor to introduce the chair of our ISBA department and professor of information systems and business analytics, Professor Kala Seal. Hello, good evening, everybody. And again, you know, welcome. Welcome to our cybersecurity panel and discussions for this evening. And uh, thank you all for joining and special thanks to all of the panelists and Professor Mangal who has um, organized this particular panel. Uh, I was going to say a few things, but then uh, 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 our Dean Smith has already said that. So I guess that's why she's the Dean and I'm still the chair, but um, uh, joking aside, uh, actually, you know, this is really, really interesting because we live in an unprecedented time. I think it's Nam Jun Pak who said that the future is now, the artist who also coined the term information superhighway. And 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 I don't think that that could have been even uh, truer at, at any other given point of time than this particular time. It's just uh, incredible that the future that uh, you envision, you know, and you think it is futuristic suddenly, suddenly becomes reality in a very, very short period of time. The acceleration that's happening in the technology, the pace with which we are all moving towards this connected world, thanks to the information superhighway known as the internet, and, and, and all of the innovations that are coming to make our life easier are also making us rather vulnerable, I will say, at every point, touch point that we have in this digital age. I mean, just think about it. I mean, we are creating data, we are consuming data, every step that you take, every you know, show that you watch, every transaction that you make, all of them are creating this huge avalanche of data and they're getting stored somewhere, they're getting communicated somewhere and all of these are open to attacks to, you know, can be stolen and can be used for unintended purposes. Let's just put it that way. So it is really, really important for everybody to understand that what does it mean to, to live, to operate in this particular digital age, whether it's individually or even you know, as an organizational entity or through your professional life. We are all interconnected. And I think uh, the pandemic two years have probably made that even more prominent and clear that how dependent we are and what the technology has done to us and how we are getting connected through that technology. Tonight, we are really, really lucky to have panelists from different parts of the cyber security ecosystem. We have somebody who is going to talk about small and medium-sized enterprises and to talk about the resilience part that uh, Dean Smith or Dale has said that it's not only because, you know, I don't think that it's a question of, uh, it, it's just, a, you know, if it's a question of when um, breach, security breaches are going to happen, whether it's a small organization or a large organization, knowing how to defend it and then how to get out of it when the breach happens 
that's really, really important. We are going to have this, you know, this cloud system that we take for granted, right? We put everything in iCloud and, and yet we do not know how they are getting secured. What is happening? We take it for granted on a personal level. Oh, somebody is going to look at it. Who is that somebody? And, and how, how, how that is going to be watched over. So one of our panelists is going to talk about that. Along with that, she's also going to talk a little bit about how, you know, what she felt being in this particular uh, cybersecurity ecosystem as a, as a woman. We are going to also have an expert in blockchain who is going to talk about all of these different kind of digitization and the tokenization of the assets and how it prevents from theft. All of you who are familiar with tokens coming in, whether it's a duo or whether it's an OTP, one-time password that's coming to your phone, how, how, do you, how do you make sure that these are secured? How do you make sure that there is not a human being in the middle who can actually steal it undetected? I think blockchain technology comes to the rescue of that. And then finally, it's the policy. No system, doesn't matter how bulletproof it is, the policy, the people, the understanding, and the regulations, that finally makes it what it is intended to be. And we have a speaker who is going to talk about that. With that, I want to welcome you all and thank you again for joining and a big round of applause to all of our speakers. Thank you. And I'm going to now introduce Professor Anna Mangal, who is in my department and who has actually organized this to say a few words and welcome all of the panelists. Thank you, Carla. And welcome everyone to our uh, panel discussion this evening, which is going to be focusing on cybersecurity and blockchain in the global digital age. We are, I'm going to start by introducing our four panelists. And while they take their seats after that, uh, they will be making brief remarks. Uh, they will be sharing their perspectives and their work with you. Uh, we will move into a structured Q&A session where I will be asking them questions. Uh, and then we will open it up for your questions. Uh, Marquis is uh, going to be um, posting uh, when she is ready to receive your questions in the Q&A and the chat. Um, and we will take your questions from there uh, once we move into the open Q&A session. Uh, so welcome again. I'm going to uh, begin by introducing Chala Krifi Brown. Um, Chala, if you would join me. Uh, Chala is an accomplished multidisciplined leader with 20 years of dedicated experience working with executives, boards, and leading edge technology companies to strategically leverage new opportunities for growth in existing and new markets. She currently serves as Associate Dean for Executive and Part-Time Programs at the Pepperdine Kratzidio School of Business. She serves as Editor-in-Chief of Technology in Society and is a seasoned board member. She has extensive experience working in the information system security and risk, and she's going to be sharing her perspectives with us this evening. She has completed several projects with companies in the space and is a frequent speaker on this topic. I met her when I was at Pepperdine, uh, <laughs> and we had an opportunity to work together. Welcome, Charla. Uh, next, we have Alex Nascimento. Alex, if you would join me. He is MA, MBA. And Alex is a serial entrepreneur and founding partner of 7CC Blockchain Investments and 7 Visions LATAM Dig Digital. He's also a faculty and co-founder of Blockchain at UCLA, where he lectures on blockchain business applications and security tokens. Additionally, Alex is the best-selling author of the STO Financial Revolution, which is a textbook uncovering regulated and compliant fundraising via blockchain. He got his MBA from UCLA Anderson School of Management and has developed training, marketing, and blockchain strategies for companies in the United States and different parts of the world. He speaks at global blockchain conferences 
and he is going to be sharing his perspectives on blockchain. Uh, we had an opportunity to work together at UCLA. Welcome, Alex. Hi, Vandana. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and looking forward to this panel. As Vandana mentioned, I've been teaching blockchain at UCLA since 2017-18. Um, today we have a curriculum there and aside from my academic efforts, I run a investment company that looks into tokenizing real assets and distributing them through institutional channels. Happy to talk about uh, KYT, which is a, a new term in cybersecurity and blockchain whenever is, is the appropriate time. Looking forward to it, Alex, thank you. Next we have Rick Keringer. Rick, if you would join us. Rick is the Chief Information Officer of Wedgwood Inc. joining in March, 2020. Past experience includes CIO and Head of Technology Roles at the Westfield Group, Caruso Affiliated, the Brookings Institution, and the Milken Institute. Rick also led a business unit developing projects at Trimble, a Silicon Valley technology company. He's earned his MS in tech for business from Johns Hopkins Business School. He holds a BS in finance and earned various professional technology management certificates. He's also participated on various academic research steering committees and nonprofit boards. He's currently a strategic advisor to Triage a tech company revolutionizing the diagnosis, treatment, and care of injured children. He's on the LMU ISBA advisory board. And uh, we met when he participated on a panel on FinTech. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Anna. Happy to be here. And we have Maria. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Maria Delazio is uh, an alum, 2014 uh, CBA alum. Uh, she is an innovator in cybersecurity space. She's with Unit 42. We need to know what that means, Maria, as uh, you speak this evening. Unit 42 Channel Partner Program at Palo Alto Networks. She has been in the industry for seven years. She gained global experience by planning technical conferences, advisory councils, and spearheading all partner social media initiatives. As a seasoned channel partner champion taking on a new role with Unit 42, she's focused on advancing the breadth of proactive services partners can offer customers to build their cyber resilience and get out of the reactive vortex. Driven by a mission to protect our digital way of life, Maria strives to inspire an ever-growing ecosystem of partners to protect tens of thousands of organizations across the cloud, networks, and mobile devices. Welcome, Maria. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm going to ask each of our panelists to speak uh, and share their thoughts and perspectives, and we will start with Maria. Thank you, Anna. I have a couple of slides to go through today. Just wanna kind of set the stage for why we're really here and why cybersecurity is so important in this digital day and age. Pretty much everything in cybersecurity has been changing, as I'm sure everyone knows, from the customer to the issues, solutions, just a slew. But our total addressable market really for cyber cybersecurity is 221 billion. So there's a lot of money to be made here and a lot of security to see as well. Um, in addition to my role at Palo Alto Networks, um, like Anna mentioned, I am with Unit 42 and they're our threat consulting and intelligence arm of Palo Alto Networks. At Palo, they have a slew of different um, securities and risks that they are dealing with each and every day. Um, actually, there's over 220 billion uh, alerts that they are seeing every single day. So the amount that's coming in is incredible that they're allowed, they're able to really focus on each and every one of them um, to really resolve the issues. So the fact that at each and every customer is really trying to accelerate their move to the cloud, especially with remote work and 
cyber criminals just really increasing their knowledge as well um, and just being easier than ever to really get into the ransomware and cyber realm. Um, we really at Palo Alto Networks are trying to promote a platform and portfolio approach that really encompasses the entire um, risk solution and really manage your uh, risks proactively since breaches are becoming more and more frequent, difficult to resolve, and more costly than ever. Like I mentioned, it's incredible um, to see these numbers. The average ransomware payment in 2021 was actually up 78%, and it's approximately $541,000, which is crazy, and demands for specific industries are rising even quicker. To talk about um, how common they are is even crazier. 63% um, of all organizations um, that we've uh, surveyed have been saying that they've been breached in 2021. So just seeing it more rampant than ever and the lack of automation and really integration of each of the different solutions is a big problem here. So we're here to try and solve that today because really a hacker only needs to be accurate and successful one time and in order for them to really get into your entire business system. We're seeing a huge increase in ransomware in terms of um, our alerts in addition to our 68,000 uh, alerts daily. So it's pretty incredible um, to see this growth. And because several companies aren't re really planning for the not if but when situation that's really on the horizon now. It's just a macro issue at its core. So we actually recently just did a study um, with Unit 42 to determine how many different organizations are really utilizing their cyber risk management solutions to the fullest. And we found that access is a huge problem right now. Um, there are just too many permissions being granted for people that don't necessarily really need access to solutions, programs, etc. So I just want to take a quick poll. Uh, does anyone know how many organizations and cloud users um, are granted excessive permissions um, in this day and age? You could just put it in the chat. Give you a minute or so. actually 99%. So almost all organizations are granting excessive passwords, which is really a problem that we need to solve for immediately. And that's really with a reactive approach, which is what Unit 42 is thriving for. With that, it over. Thank you so much, Maria for introducing us to cybersecurity and those numbers are tremendous. Um, if if uh, uh, it wasn't enough to just for us to be just aware of how important cybersecurity is, uh, that's a great start to our conversation this evening. Next, I'd like to invite Rick Geringer to present his perspectives. Great, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thanks for um, kind of setting the stage from the macro perspective. What I wanna do is just spend a few minutes talking about what I consider more the micro, I guess the, the real micro is down the individual user. But when I think about an enterprise, a mid-sized enterprise like us, uh, I think that it's important for us to um, make everybody aware to the extent possible of uh, the threats that we, that we have and how, to, how each person can help protect uh, the enterprise, help protect themselves, et cetera. So what I want to do is just hit a couple points, and then if Mark, you could throw up a slide at the end. Um, this slide at the end will be sort of a how we do it, but I wanted just to share uh, a couple thoughts before that. First of all, um, doesn't matter. I think Colin mentioned this. Doesn't matter if you're big or small, you're high profile or you're low profile. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, the bad guys are out for opportunities. 
I often hear things like, oh, you know, we're not big enough. We're not, you know, we're not the, these big companies that, that, that are well known uh, to be attacked, but you don't have to be today because uh, many of the sophisticated systems start with bots and all the bots do is they go around and they, they basically uh, check to see if doors are locked. If there's an unlocked door over here, they basically communicate back to their human hacker and say at this address, there is an unlocked door. So you're so we're dealing with large, large scale reconnaissance and um, and access basically. So we are a, a mid-sized, low, pro, low profile real estate investment and financial services company. So we hit the radar for those reasons, um, even though again, we're low profile. Uh, we're also like a, a number of other companies in our size or our band. Um, we have a chief information officer. We don't have a chief information security officer. So often uh, basically I have to wear two hats throughout this. And I will say that um, in the last two years, uh, security has taken almost 50% of my time in, in this capacity, which is, which is uh, a lot relative to what we're trying to do um, from a business perspective. Uh, and these threats are, are real. We, I have a number of colleagues that have been hit already. Uh, I know board members, uh, Charlie, you may have comment on this too, but uh, board members will say, yeah, I sit on four boards, three of them been hacked. And so again, they, everyone says it's not a matter of if it's when. Uh, we've had a couple incidents uh, that we have um, been able to handle without uh, big concern. But uh, my biggest concern is a ransomware attack. And that's basically a two-stage attack. They come in, they steal your data, and then um, they encrypt your systems. They ask you for the ransom. And then after you pay the ransom and potentially get your systems back up, uh, it, it, uh, uh, you know, then they come back and say, okay, we're gonna post all this data out on the dark web unless you pay us another ransom. Uh, and I think the slide that Maria showed earlier, that downtime is the most costly, the more in, potentially more costly than even paying the ransom. Because uh, I heard at one stat, it takes 21 days to, to get back completely on average after a ransomware attack. Because they're sophisticated at encrypting, but not always sophisticated in helping you de-encrypt. And by the way, once you write them a check, or sorry, you send them some Bitcoin, uh, you're on your own. So last thing I want to uh, mention before I throw up that slide is cybersecurity insurance. Okay, we're a company that's, uh, that's important to us. Premiums have increased um, by an average of 80% in the first quarter of 2022. Multiply that times four on an annual basis, we're talking about 250% increases in, in premiums. Um, we're fortunate enough, I'm not going to talk about it, we, had, we didn't hit that high because we were able to show um, our, our um, uh, the depth of our uh, secure, cybersecurity capabilities. Uh, policy limits have been reduced by half. So now you can't even get the limits you want. And to offset that, the uh, used to be a million dollar uh, ransom was what you heard or you read when you came in in the morning, it was on your screen. And now they're starting around $10 million, understanding that people like us have extortion um, uh, negotiation capabilities. So we're talking, you know, this stuff is, is 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 real and that cybersecurity insurance you have to qualify for that they will do a deep dive and a lot of people just uh, are uninsurable because of that so marky can you just throw this the slide up real quickly i just want to mention <clears throat> that there is uh, the, the approach that we take is multi-layered this is common in in cybersecurity, sort of the onion model um, but every, every company does technical operations. Some start to do security operation. That's where the layers of security happen. And then, um, but to, in order to respond and to recover, you have to have the security event management layer where you have managed service providers like Maria's company and many others that assist companies like ours in this area so that we understand when we are attacked. And then finally, if we really need it, we bring in some of the managed service providers that we have on retainer for critical incident responses. So that sort of wraps up uh, my perspective as a, a mid-market um, CIO. Back to you, Anna. Thank you, Rick. Next, we have Alex. Uh, Alex will share his perspectives on cybersecurity, blockchain, and assets. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Vandana, for inviting me. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, something that most of people haven't heard about, which is, uh, I'm sure a lot of people heard about the term KYC with, and AML, right, which are surrounding around knowing your customer and anti-money laundering, uh, which were two terms that were have a heavily enforced by the U.S. administration after 9-11 across the entire world. For people that don't know this, if you transact in dollars, and U.S. dollars in many where in the world, you are under the USA's jurisdiction. So the term KYC and AML was used to diffuse terrorist actions and a lot of other um, illegal activities. But I teach blockchain at UCLA and I've been doing so for a few years now. And I focus on institutionalization of blockchain technology. And something that we're noticing uh, that's becoming at the forefront of utilizing blockchain as a solution for cybersecurity is a new term called KYT. And I don't know if anyone knows what KYT is, but KYT stands for Know Your Transaction. For those of you that are familiar with blockchain technology, you can track every transaction for the history of time of that blockchain in a mailing, like in an open database. So here are a couple of things that I'm going to briefly cover on what KYT is. So like I mentioned, KYT is Know Your Transaction, and it combines industry-leading blockchain intelligence and APIs to use uh, interfaces and real-time APIs to help organizations reduce and manage risk workflows, stay compliant with regulations, and safely interact with emerging technologies like blockchain or DeFi, right? And uh, why is KYT becoming so important? Is because because of the use of KYT, you can identify high-risk cyber activity. And the idea is to map hundreds and millions of addresses for those of you who are familiar with blockchain addresses. Those are your identities or your digital wallets on the blockchain or on blockchains, right? And this includes uh, tracking for like darknet markets, scams, like other panelists mentioned, ransomware and legitimate services from merchants and crossing these informations to identify where the bridges and where the hacks and where the potential threats are happening across different platforms. So we're seeing this being used a lot with the rise of DeFi. For those of you not familiar with what DeFi means, DeFi stands for Decentralized Finance. And it's kind of like building blocks of uh, financial products that are run by smart contracts that can either lend money or borrow money uh, without having an intermediary. And the solution that blockchain tech brings to this is a continuously transaction monitoring of all these assets, right? And detecting patterns that are of high risk and present transactions with addresses that have been on lists like OFAC. Uh, OFAC is one of the most prominent lists in the world of people that are under, are under sanctions, uh, which we're seeing now with like countries like Russia. Uh, so things can be a freeze of a deposit from hacks or ransomwares or screening of Ethereum wallets. So via blockchain, companies and organizations can configure their real-time alerts based on their anti-money laundering policy and risk mitigation policies. But we don't see that only with DeFi. We also see that with NFTs, right? Uh, Non-fungible tokens like the Bored Apes or the Cyberpunks or a lot, of, a lot of NFTs were very popular last year. And by monitoring all these NFT addresses, uh, an entity can in real time intelligence source the destination of the funds that are coming to buy these NFTs and help organizations and individuals uh, make safe trades or buy crypto collectibles that are legitimate, 
and not rug pulls or participate in lending contracts that contribute to liquidity protocols where good actors are participating. Uh, we're seeing a lot of integration of KYT across different organizations. KYT works best when it's focused around existing compliance teams workflows where companies, governments uh, can record every step of their workflow and fully audit uh, a deep trail of what's happening and share that with banks and regulators to stop back that actors. And we're seeing this investigation happen on chain. On chain, there are transactions that happen and are registered on a blockchain. So companies can now investigate transactions using graphic interfaces to flow, to trace the flow of funds and um, unlimited number of like uh, hoops where suspicious activities can be flagged. And when I mean flagged, these are alerts, right? And these alerts are, are being uh, designed to generate both like a transfer alert whenever there's a fund transfer or commits to a predefined behavior pattern of the user. And this hybrid approach is making the bridge between what in the previous years, banks and financial institutions would use to provide KYC and AML and prevent fraud with now that being transported to digital assets. So if you believe in digital assets, you will certainly hear KYT a lot in the next uh, near future. Alex, thank you so much uh, for sharing your perspectives and looking forward to discussing them even in more detail as we get to the Q&A session. Uh, next, we, Thank you, Alex. Next, we have Chala. Chala to share her perspectives on uh, cyber blockchain risk awareness. Thank you. It's exciting to see everybody here today, all the number of participants that we have and to learn from my fellow panelists. I was really excited to hear KYT mentioned, Alex, because I've um, I've worked with chain analysis uh, and, uh, and I think that there are some important opportunities here um, in terms of uh, what we're trying to uh, accomplish with cyber resilience. And I am just going to briefly touch on some high level things I think it's important for us to come with in terms of perspective. And, um, and what I want to do is I want us to, um, to change our thinking. Um, I'm going to give the perspective of kind of at the board level, but ultimately I think uh, it's important for us to all reconsider the mental models we have of both enterprise architecture and, and ultimately of uh, what cybersecurity is. So for me, the most important um, terms, I believe, that will define sustainable competitive advantage in our global digital world of the 21st century are, revolve around risk and agility. Um, with emerging technologies, they can amplify um, uh, problems or they can amplify solutions. They can accelerate problems, accelerate solutions. So we really have to be mindful of, um, of, of how we are thinking about these technologies and how we are thinking about cyber risk, for example. And what I think is critically important <laughs> is to understand, and you'll notice that this is in the context of an orchestra, that cybersecurity, cyber risk is really a team sport. Uh, we did an analysis a few years ago of cyber criminal enterprises and their business models, which we spoke to the Pacific Telecommunications uh, Council about, and, um, and they're really really sophisticated business models. And we are dealing with cyber criminal enterprises, not just single actors in the space of cyber criminal activity. We also have to recognize that this is a team sport. And, uh, and in order to address what's happening, increased velocity, increased volume, all that you heard from uh, the first panelist regarding what's happening in our world with the, with the expanding attack landscape, we have to think differently. Um, this isn't a technology problem, as was also um, uh, indicated uh, earlier. This is a people in process problem. And what we really advocate um, is a, a risk-based approach, given that this isn't a technology problem. And I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by that. 
Um, it's important for us to understand, um, and blockchain is a part of this, as our um, other emerging technologies that we're, that we're expanding how we think about enterprise architecture. That's been happening for a long time, and therefore this risk-based approach makes a lot of sense. But there are different ways to talk about risk, and um, enterprise risk is a critical problem at the board level, at the executive level, regardless of what industry you, you're in. Whether I'm working with Johnson & Johnson, which I I have in the past had the privilege of working with their medical devices, or whether it's with um, Paramount Pictures, um, a risk and risk evaluation is critical across the organization, and cyber risk is situated in that context. Um, now, our mental model about risk is typically max-min. Um, and at, even from a mathematical perspective, we've been thinking about risk for a long time in terms of minimization. I think what our models that we use demonstrate is that this is perhaps not the best way to think about risk in the world that we live in where resilience is important. And in fact, um, in business, you have to take on risk if you are going to be profitable. So anytime that you are minimizing risk, you may also be minimizing opportunity. And so well, the model that we have developed is really around optimal control. It's a risk optimization model as opposed to a max min model because there's upside risk and there's downside risk. The upside risk being the opportunities in this digital world that businesses need to take advantage of in order to remain competitive. And of course, the downside risk is all of the risk associated with loss and cost. And, and yes, um, we have to think about what we're going to do with this risk, transfer it and we, we talked briefly about cyber liability insurance or whether we're going to pay for it and if we're going to pay for it, how we're going to pay for it. And of course, what that means in terms of our cybersecurity programs and resilience. And I think one of the most important things that we can bring to the table, um, literally when it comes to the boardroom and it, when it becomes to engineering, design, operations, are different perspectives. Because ultimately what I found, regardless of what industry you are in, is that if you have different optics at the table, you are more likely to be able to deal with risk differently. Even from a financial perspective, when you're looking at things such as real options, you're going to be thinking differently if you have the diversity around the room. So I think it's important. And you'll be asking different questions. And you'll notice I put here, asking questions is strategically important. Um, I want to emphasize that because I think um, essential to all good cybersecurity programs, regardless of the enterprise architecture, is this constant questioning um, and how we are continuing to unfold um, our, our different systems in the context of this questioning. Now, I do want to us to think differently. So um, in the past, when it came to enterprise architecture and it came to this problem, we had this idea of a perimeter. Um, and so we had this medieval way of thinking about um, cybersecurity, particularly when we had a less complicated enterprise architecture. And, um, and what we have to do is we have to pivot that to understand that ultimately what we're doing now in terms of uh, cybersecurity and enterprise architecture is we are building something more akin to a city, something in which we have to consider very carefully our governance. We have to consider very carefully contingency, business continuity. There are all of these things that we have to build into our cybersecurity and risk programs, and that needs to start with each initiative, this conversation about risk, if it becomes deeply embedded in our thinking, then as we um, anticipate uh, business opportunities and develop strategy towards that um, with appropriate governance, we'll be thinking about what risk we, that might entail and how we want to optimize that risk. And I'm happy to speak about that in more detail with some of the organizations that I've worked with. Now, um, specifically with blockchain, and um, this is a critical um, enterprise architecture that is that um, that I think is going to continue to play a significant role um, throughout the business world. Uh, last year, we published um, uh, in a, a book that was focused just on blockchain in 
in Europe, and we analyzed um, different risks on and off the chain. Um, and I think that there are a number of risks that exist on and off the chain, just as we would see in any emerging technology that we were unfolding. Some of them have to do with people in processes. In fact, um, a significant proportion <laughs> of them have to do with uh, people in processes. And having KYT as a mechanism for, um, uh, for helping us with this, I think is very, very powerful. Um, I do want to think about how we uh, really address um, you know, information system security, where we've come from and where we are and where we need to be. Um, we often talk about this information security maturity model uh, when we're talking to executives about their organizations. And a, a lot of companies are still here in this blocking and tackling phase where they're underfunded, lack of executive support um, when we were uh, hearing about small and medium-sized enterprises, for example, a, a lot of SMEs have to just move beyond um, blocking and tackling into compliance and being proactive. It's really hard when you're under-resourced and having to set priorities based on, um, on what you have ahead of you and in front of you, knowing that um, uh, obscurity is not an excuse, which uh, was mentioned, that a lot of companies think they're too small. Now, in fact, you could be a prime target because um, that creates a kill chain uh, that may open up other doors. So companies are ideally moving towards compliance and we see a lot more compliance driven organizations um, around us, which are leveraging frameworks, which are thinking differently. And this helps them get insurance, by the way, if they want cyber liability insurance, even though, as was mentioned, it's extraordinarily expensive and, and there are significant limits even now. Where I hope that all of our organizations are moving is towards this risk-based approach that I mentioned that is indeed multi-layered, as we saw, where we're using user behavior and entity analytics to understand, um, and things such as KYT, very similar to KI KYT, where we're understanding the dynamics of the systems and the users, where we're linking things across different disciplines, and where we're using dynamic infosec and audit um, controls within the environment. And ultimately, um, this environment is extremely dynamic. So we have to similarly be dynamic. And just to give you um, a, a brief look at this, um, I just happened to pull up a, um, uh, you know, a, um, a real time attack map. Um, there are plenty that are out there, and I thought I would share this with you just before I step off the screen. And um, and here you go. Uh, it'll come up in just a second, ideally. Come on, Mab. Where you can see um, right now volume and velocity to a to a good extent, um, and uh, this is continuous. It's it's nonstop. Uh, and so this is a problem that we all have to be aware of. We all have to be intimately involved with. And, uh, and the, the academy, the public sector, um, the private sector, we have to work collaboratively uh, in order to uh, find appropriate solutions that will help us all create a future worth wanting. That looks really good, uh, Chala. Thank you so much for for sharing that, um, and and as well as the map. We're really impressed to see that. Uh, so we will move to our Q and A uh, portion. Um, if if I can please ask all the panelists to join me, so that uh, we can move into the Q and A session. Uh, this question is for Maria and for Rick. Uh, so for anybody uh, who is trying to understand the space of cybersecurity, can you set a lay of the land uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of technology, in terms of business, uh, so that our students here and everybody who's joining us today are able to walk away with now I have a better handle on cybersecurity? Sure. So like... I'm sure a lot of the panelists have mentioned, um, really automation and integration are critical for the future of cybersecurity. And essentially, future of cybersecurity is similar to that of a self-driving car. We're driving towards autonomous security operations capabilities and AI and machine learning to really stop attack immediately in the networks. 
And innovation really does depend on our collaboration with the best in the industry. So with Unit 42, we do have a really strong threat intelligence firm and we're constantly um, posting bulletins and slew of resources just to collaborate with others in the industry so that we are all aware of what needs to be protected because you can't protect what you don't know. Yeah, and I think also you need to think about cybersecurity not having a border, not really caring who you are. Um, you are a potential victim, uh, you and your company, I should say. Uh, there's a consumer side and then there's a corporate side, right? So I've, I've reflected mostly on the enterprise side. The, the uh, consumer side, it's hard, hard for me to get my head around. There's so many various uh, threats that are out there and so many difficult ways to, um, to uh, protect against it. Uh, but uh, you know, with geopolitical tensions uh, growing um, and, and people out there trying to prove themselves, there's uh, financial opportunities involved, uh, attack, strategies are advancing very quickly, keeping everybody uh, and Maria's uh, company and others on their toes. Things happen all the time. Uh, every day, even a company like ours, we're dealing with uh, things that we have to look at. I, I know that Kala mentioned billions and bill I think it was Kala mentioning billions and billions of, uh, of uh, alerts every day. Um, we, we get enough to keep us busy um, and, and it's happening everywhere. So I think from a from a business perspective, you have to think about it as a risk concern and one that is manageable and, and there are models to follow. You have to act, you have to be proactive, you have to have a, a bit of paranoia to drive your, uh, what you're looking after. But um, there's enough in the, in the media today to help educate people about the threats, millions of examples, but really companies need to start acting and really thinking around some of those uh, frameworks that Charla had mentioned uh, as guidance for, for some of these cybersecurity controls. So um, it's not just, it's not a tech issue. Tech is sort of the foundation of the problem and the foundation of, of the supporting the cure, but uh, it's really a business issue. Thank you. So taking that to address our blockchain, um, when can blockchain help with cyber? And uh, Charla, you and Alex both addressed this a little bit in terms of introducing us to uh, many of the aspects there. And Charla, for you in terms of risk, Alex, for you in terms of assets and smart contracts. Why don't you jump in first, Alex? <laughs> I, I want to hear what you say. <laughs> before I jump in. Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, so I think that one of the things that it's important to note when we're talking about digital assets is that um, we have different blockchains, right? And think about different blockchains as kind of like different accounting protocols or, or accounting books, one written in Japanese, the other written in English, the other written in German. As of today, there is very few tools that allow translation between these uh, different blockchains. So one blockchain to communicate with another. Some blockchains are more resilient. Uh, so we see the Bitcoin blockchain never actually being hacked. So I just bring this point because a lot of people say, oh, you know, I got hacked. I lost my funds. Um, I lost my digital assets. It's important to note that that hack or that cyber attack is done on the individual endpoint, right? Whereas like someone gets the access to your laptop and then has access to your digital wallet and then transfers the funds from your digital wallet to their digital wallet or to a bad actor's digital wallet. Uh, but the blockchain itself majority of the blockchains are really secure because the transactions are all there. So uh, to, to that extent, I would just like to conclude that there is, there is a significant difference in hacking a blockchain or hacking the individual endpoint that is accessing that blockchain. So the, the last advice here is not your keys, not your coins, uh, if you have digital assets on an exchange, 
the, you're exposed to cybersecurity on that exchange. If you have your digital assets on your cold wallet that's not touching the internet, the risks are that you lose the cold wallet. If it is a hot wallet in, in your computer, the risks are that somebody hacks your computer. Hmm. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm glad that I let you go first. I don't have to repeat. <laughs> of that, particularly uh, given that, you, as you mentioned, there's this translation reality. Um, uh, and I love your metaphor, Alex, of different languages. Um, very apropos. I also think it's critical to understand the, the architecture itself imposes certain strengths, which are very powerful. And um, one of the things that we found, uh, and I'm just going to show you, I'm just... Uh, throwing in this paper, um, when we looked at some of the cases of attacks, Mt. Mox, Ethereum, Steemit, Coincheck, Voits, um, as you mentioned, a lot of these were off chain. These, were, these weren't, you know, what I would necessarily say are technology hacks. And, and that's why um, we started classifying these things into a kind of taxonomy. What happens on the chain? What happens off the chain? Where are technical vulnerabilities? Where are the other vulnerabilities? And uh, you have to do that with any technology. Um, I think there are some significant strengths with blockchain, which make our ability to um, transact powerfully secure, um, but also we're dealing with people who are going to try to make an end run around this, such as a 51% Sybil attack where you have some, um, uh, where, where you've made an end run in terms of what you own in a chain. Now, a lot of the things that, I, that we've looked at have, have do not have to do with assets, with crypto assets. Although I, I did show you some that uh, occasionally had, as you mentioned, not all blockchains are equal. Some have thought through this much more carefully than others. Um, but uh, blockchain distributed ledger as an architecture serves a variety of functions. And so um, within those functions, there's both physical opportunity for um, uh, for compromise. And uh, there are other opportunities for compromise, which um, cyber criminals are very opt um, very opportunistic. And so um, as, a, as a people in process problem, it's important for us to keep those in mind. Thank you. Uh, both. Uh, so going back to uh, cyber a little bit more, uh, Maria, can you walk us through who are the key players and what are some of the products and services that businesses who are looking, businesses or individuals who are looking to uh, keep the system secure can tap into? Sure. So um, at Palo Alto Networks, Unit 42 really focuses on the threat intelligence aspect. Um, and since they do have over 240 billion alerts each day, they do in fact have a ton of threat intelligence to pull from across the industry. Um, so we do put out a ton of reports. Um, we recently had an incident response report that really details the kind of attacks that we're seeing uh, most frequently. And the top two there were ransomware and business email compromise. Um, that was actually um, attributed 70% of all attacks that we saw that were um, incident response attacks. So uh, from there, we really think that the focus on enabling and educating um, your employees from the top down is really crucial. Uh, without education and them knowing um, really what's coming and how to rectify the situation or alert the right people, um, a lot of this will just keep continuing. So I think that education is needed. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, to you, uh, you travel all over the world in um, and, and you also work with uh, Latin America, especially. Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of cyber and blockchain? Are you seeing some leapfrogging in the de developing economies in terms of how they're handling cyber and blockchain? Uh, most certainly. We're seeing like a huge adoption of... Um, countries that are, are not that don't have necessarily a strong uh, currency where inflation is very present in these countries 
So, you know, not to take it to a different uh, topic, but what we're seeing, especially in Latin America, is that there was a rise of online banks that were bringing people that were unbanked to the banking environment, right? So majority of these people never had the experience that you and I have of banking or going into a branch uh, and operating with financial services. Most of these people see their banking experience through their mobile and through their smartphones. And then the evolution of that, we're seeing that these online banks are now distributing crypto to these users, uh, which serves like two sides of it, right? One, um, it's a, it's a um, more um, or a less sophisticated way of analyzing data of, of investment because there isn't really a PL for the Bitcoin corporation for you to look. You either believe it's going to go up or you believe it's going to go down. Um, and we're seeing a lot of these banks make a lot of a lot of fees and a lot of uh, profit out of trading these digital assets because there's so much volatility in the price of these assets on a 24 hour window. So we're seeing evolutions coming from like the institutional side to house digital assets and distribute them to previously unbanked users, which are experiencing all their financial services and all their financial assets on the palms of their hands. Really interesting um, uh, see, to hear that and see that happening. Uh, and uh, Chala, this is for you in terms of um, academia. So how do we, how can academia prepare students for cyber, uh, cyber and blockchain? Can we, we've been talking more recently about we uh, almost need to build an ecosystem with partnerships. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, as you know, the academy moves much slower <laughs> than business or technology. So um, the, the fundamental um, tension is, is the ability to be market ready and relevant. I think what's absolutely critical, as you mentioned, was partnerships and collaboration. I think that um, the academy can certainly uh, be a, a mediator for, um, for relationships that are critical. We held um, Cybersecure SoCal, Cybersecure LA, bringing in CISOs, bringing in um, uh, uh, law enforcement. They play a critical role, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Secret Service, um, FBI, uh, and of course, um, the county and local CIOs, um, as well as corporations. Um, what, what we find is that um, oftentimes, cyber criminal enterprises, which I've mentioned before, um, they're work. They have. They're working together. <laughs> they have um, figured out ways to share information and uh, undertake their nefarious activities. We need to similarly find ways to be more collaborative. And of course, um, Mayor Garcia Garcia had cyber labs. There's Secure the Village. There are local um, organizations within LA that I think play a role, but we need to be more intentional um, in the academy uh, for being that connector and connecting to ideas which can help us, um, particularly as we think through what are the larger um, um, meta realities that will help us uh, collaboratively uh, address ways of thinking about these problems. And, uh, and how can we then um, ask better questions? How can we then uh, help boards and executives become more affluent with, um, uh, with, with risk? And think about that in a different way. How can we um, be uh, more of a, 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 I would say a mediator in this whole ecosystem that is, uh, that is enabling some of this collaboration to happen? Thank you, Charla. One more question, and this one's for Rick, and then we will open it up for your questions. Uh, Marky and I'll be asking you questions, so if you haven't posted, please post them in the Q&A. Uh, Rick, so what advice do you have for students graduating today in terms of preparing for uh, cybersecurity, blockchain, and data analytics? Uh, Carla also alluded to it. 
Uh, I, first of all, I want to note that uh, I see at LMU focused uh, very much on these uh, three very important areas. So um, data analytics, no question, that's a growth area I see as a practitioner. Uh, and then also cybersecurity, which you, we can't help but grow. We probably don't want to make the investments, but we have to. Um, so that's a, definitely a growth area. It's ever-changing, moving quickly, and then also blockchain. And so um, it, from a technology perspective, if I was talking to the CIS students, uh, it would be, you know, focus very much on, um, on the, the, the operational technology and then and to understand your entire uh, technical infrastructure, be it in the cloud, on premise or elsewhere, and, um, and, and learn the underpinnings of technology first. And then you'll better understand and, and be able to manage and articulate uh, the value of the, the specific security systems on top. And then from really from the business perspective, and I try to do this in everything that I, everything I do, I try to to bring technology and, and tech and uh, business together is awareness and not just the awareness to look for certain things in an email so you don't get trapped, don't click on the link, that's important awareness, but really uh, general awareness of, in, the, in your thinking about what, uh, what you do as a business. And it's not just limited to technology from a cyber, I mean, from a security perspective, there's all sorts of ways to be extorted or, or to fall into traps. And to just be conscious of that as we charge on operationally and, and with our strategies as a company, uh, be very conscious of it. So take that risk perspective. I love uh, the way you framed it, Charla, and it, it, it's not a technology question. It is always a risk question. Technology is just an enabler or a, uh, a support mechanism. So I, I encourage students in, in all these disciplines in business school, as well as in the computer information systems uh, programs to, to think of across the line here and, and really uh, go for the, those disciplines and help un, try to understand the discipline on the other side of the line. Thank you, Rick. Uh, moving to the Q&A uh, portion, um, we, Mark, you, will you start with the questions? Sure, thank you, Anna. And the first question we have is, um, is the security, the cybersecurity insurance industry struggling to establish cost of the plan and payout because there is so little historical data on this topic versus other insurable things like earthquakes, fire insurance, et cetera? Feel free to jump in. I'll jump in a little bit. Can can you um uh can you repeat the first part? Is it because of yes, is is the secure cybersecurity insurance industry struggling to establish cost of the plan and payout because there is so little historical data on this topic versus other insurable things like earthquakes, fire insurance, et cetera? I would say no. Um, in fact, uh, the, the really large insurance companies that are still offering cyber liability insurance, um, th this is not a new problem, first of all. This is a problem that's been around for 20, 30 <laughs> years. Um, what has happened, of course, is acceleration and amplification and increased landscape. And of course, um, uh, there are a lot more players. Um, so uh, from my experience with the, the uh, cyber liability insurance companies, and I would love others, is that certainly there's an, enough data to understand certain levels of risk, the perils, um, you know, some of the costs. Uh, and I think it's through that acute understanding that we're seeing some of the increase in premiums and the limitations that you have on the policies. Um, I do think there's a lot more work that can be done in this area because, uh, uh, quite honestly, from an evaluation perspective, there are some limitations, particularly when it comes to direct and indirect costs. Um, and I've, I've worked with some of the, the um, there's not a lot of smaller insurance companies that handle this, and the larger insurance companies are using, I would say, some uh, fairly standard models for, for coming to their, uh, you know, their, their evaluation, but, um, uh, but I do think there's some work that can be done there, certainly. 
Yeah, I can also chime in here. Um, I know the premiums are up like almost 150% now, but um, our company, Palo Alto and Unit 42, we are selling retainers services that uh, customers can use for cyber risk assessments, see really what vulnerabilities um, are on their networks uh, as of right now, see um, whether they can really go uh, to an insurance firm like that, even just to start, um, and whether they can um, really evaluate exactly what their threats are and if we need to do a mediation plan or um, just the top priorities that they need to outline first before being able to be insured. And from my perspective, uh, we I'm a buyer of insurance, so I, I listen to underwriters, brokers, etc. And what I've seen is this huge focus by these companies, and they are bigger companies, so they're arms of, of bigger companies, um, doing a couple of things. One is they're really trying to understand your business. So in, in the past, you just said, you know, yes, answered three questions on this otherwise very large um, insurance application, but now it's like 10 pages of very, very, very detailed technology questions that are asked. And so, so the companies themselves are the insurance companies are becoming much more sophisticated. And some of the more sophisticated ones are actually wrapping services around these insurance policies saying, you know what, we don't want to pay out. So let's work together to get you a little more hardened. We're, we want to, the insurance company wants to make that investment in us to harden us further so that they can uh, improve their odds of not having to pay out. So that's a huge change in, in over the last couple of years. And I think from a, how long has it been in place? Yes, Charlie, I agree that it's been around forever, but the focus in the last two years and the investments that those companies are making um, have really accelerated their understanding of the space. And so I, I think they're probably pretty good at underwriting and understanding what they're, what they're getting themselves into. Thank you. Um, let me ask uh, another question. This one is also very interesting and I'm breaking the queue here. Um, it is from an anonymous attendee. I wish I had somebody's name, but is the cybersecurity industry prepared for the future of Web3? I, I was surprised that had not come up. How can we make sure that this advancement specifically towards interactive VR is safe for users? I would say employing a zero trust architecture is definitely at the top of the list. Um, the never trust, always validate is kind of our slogan here. So um, I think that focus on really knowing where your thoughts are coming from is key. I, I agree with Maria. It's all about fundamentals, right? Um, in, in any emerging technology area, you, you still are using those principles and those fundamentals. And if you have a strong program and a governance program and you're um, working through the frameworks past compliance to really thinking about risk, then, um, then you are going to have the posture that you need regardless of what you're pulling in. How many companies are doing that? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need more. Um, um, are we prepared? I, I think we're struggling right now. <laughs> so, uh, so there's certainly um, gatherings like this are important, important conversations so that we can begin to advance our, you know, our cyber hygiene. Mm -hmm. Marky, did you want to ask another question? Sure. Um, there's a there's a long question here from M Hare for Rick. This question is a little um, tangential from the blockchain topic. From a qualitative anecdotal perspective, have you found as an SMB CIO that security considerations influence your decision making about migrating um, compute loads to the cloud? Um, AWS, Azure, GCP, et cetera. Uh, major cloud providers such as these bring dedicated security processes and teams at scale to the party. Of course, this doesn't plug all holes such, such as social engineering based attacks, but it certainly can help to have 
an outsourced professional entity involved in identifying and monitoring the attack surfaces. So I'm curious what your perspective and practical approach is and how, if security considerations play into your decision-making for tackling digital transformation initiatives. Thanks. Yeah, so quickly, the, the yes, uh, they do, they always do. Um, we, we always have security um, participating in everything that we do. That is a person on the security side cooperating and participating as we move things from our on-premise location into the cloud. One thing that uh, is part of this journey is, is uh, something that I've come to understand is that really there's two different um, environments. I mean, we know that there's two different environments, your environment in the cloud, in your environment on premise, which historically would have been a, your classic uh, cybersecurity concern. Uh, but moving them to the cloud, yes, there's better tools in the cloud to deal with um, payloads in the cloud. Um, there's different types of threats in the cloud than there are uh, on premise. Um, so I think really one has, to, unless you're a, a native 100% cloud startup, which most companies are not, you have to really think about it in two different ways. Uh, that includes your disaster recovery, your business continuity. Uh, everything uh, is at least a little bit different when you're hitting the cloud. So I hope to be in the cloud, uh, you know, be one place or the other. Being in both is, is the most complicated combination of all. Um, but we certainly take leverage all aspects of cybersecurity um, capabilities or our payloads in the cloud, as well as those that are on premise. We don't, uh, yeah, we're, we're leveraging the cloud even for those managed service providers like Maria's company um, to help us in, in both ecosystems. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'm going to switch gears for a minute uh, and we'll go back to questions uh, to, to do a couple of things. One is Dale's comment. I want to read that out. Great panel. So thank you all to the panelists. Uh, but before that, your last thoughts. So for example, Maria, what's it like being a woman in a field like uh, cyber? But for all of our panelists, in what, any last thoughts? Maria, do you want to start? Yes, sure. Um, when I started in this industry at Palo Alto in 2016, um, the entire industry was only 11% female. And now we're slowly gaining traction. We're up to 24%. So making moves slowly but surely. But being a woman in this industry is um, definitely learning experience. There's always something new and interesting to learn about. But I think the most important thing for me was like really joining the women's networking community at Palo Alto. Um, it's grown a lot too. So really coming together to do certain kinds of discussions and we bring in speakers from time to time. But um, we have a lot of different employee networks. So I think that that's been a really big asset and has helped me grow my career as well. Um, I mean, just from the start, there are, there's an SE boot camp that's two years that students can get involved with, or if you're more interested in sales, we also have like a cloud sales, um, Prisma Cloud Academy, which is an 18 month program after graduation. So there are a lot of different avenues to get into the industry. And I just don't want people to think you must be siloed to your major. Um, I was a marketing major. So being in cybersecurity is definitely a leap for me. Thank you. Um, from from um, Rick, Charla, and Alex, your last thoughts. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I would just say um, everybody on this this uh, panel, everybody in the audience, you will be affected by this uh, in your working life. And I think it's important and advantageous to those that are moving into their career or changing careers to know as much about it and to be a resource, uh, the best resource you can for the organization that you work with or work for. So um, there's a lot of different ways to, to get up to speed, just in the, in the very light way that you would to show benefit. But if you show even the inkling of an inkling of uh, understanding in this space, I think it will help drive you. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I think that my clothing, the closing thoughts surround around um, technology evolves so fast. I started my career, well, I've always been in tech. Um, I started my career doing websites, uh, evolved to online marketing, social media, and ended up in blockchain. So um, my kind of suggestion to the students who hear us is find an area of technology that interests you. I personally would say that maybe social media is a little bit too played out. You might want to find something that is a little bit more unique these days or frontier tech, uh, but find an area that interests you and then deep dive into that area. And then as technology evolves and be becomes this ubiquitous aspect of everyone's life, you will find your path. Um, but if you can find something that you interest or that you have a deep interest in, that it's more on the edges of what's being developed, I think you have a better competitive edge than a social media expert. Nothing, nothing against social media experts. Wow, that's great advice everybody has given. I think, um, uh, indeed, building on what Alex said, um, everybody is going, all of this is going to change constantly. So find something that is of interest, particularly in the emerging areas. And then I would say, have a multidisciplinary approach. Um, all of the opportunity will develop around intersections. So think carefully about that <coughs> and about, um, how that might take you forward. Those intersections are gonna be critically important. I would say it's, it's important to develop this mindset of risk if you're interested in cybersecurity because it is all about risk. And, and with that in mind, um, bringing varied experiences is absolutely uh, critical and helpful. I strongly believe that diversity and design and decision-making will help us navigate these problems because we will see things from different angles and different optics, and that's critical for arriving at solutions. So, uh, so those are my last words. Thank you. These are, these are four great pieces of advice. Uh, so with this, I see my chair back here, and I also see site director, uh, Professor Pack here, um, handing it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Anna, for moderating such a stimulating conversation. Um, Dr. Seal, uh, you've been attentively listening to this um, stimulating uh, panel discussion. So do you have any comments or the questions to the panelists? No, I, I mean, you know, I don't have any questions, but I, I just, you know, I will reiterate all of the comments that uh, that has been said. And wow. I think understanding the policy side, just not the technology side, but the policy side of the security, I think is really, really important. I mean, the technology is going to change, right? What is, you know, today is going to be really secure. Tomorrow it's going to be, you know, unsecure. There will be some holes. And, uh, but, but understanding the policy and understanding how the vulnerabilities and the risks are kind of you know, playing out at the different process and the people level. That I think is really, really important. And at the same time, I, you know, I, I will go and I'll echo what Alex has said that being on the edge, you know, the other day I was, I think, you know, we are in this, um, we are having a conversation. I was telling somebody, try to understand smart contract, because if you do that, then, you know, you will be one of those hundred peoples in the world who will really know it, you know, <laughs> pretty soon. And you'll, you'll be extremely valuable, you know, uh, then. So I think, you know, being on the edge, looking forward to all of these new things that are coming in, not being intimidated by it, but embracing them. And at the same time, understanding the process and the people that I think will be, will be the way to handle this, this, this area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, we have only a few minutes left before wrapping up this webinar. If you do not mind that actually that the, I have one last question. Um, as Rick mentioned earlier, uh, geopolitical tension is likely to increase cybersecurity threat. So can any of the panelists think of a, either country or the company who has done a relatively good job or pretty good job in handling and managing cybersecurity issues by adopting a risk-based approach as uh, Charla mentioned. 
you know, I can't jump in with any um, companies or um, countries, but I can jump in with some ideas that I think would help us all geopolitically. And that is from an institutional perspective, building on this idea of partnerships. Um, Ian Bremmer talks um, a lot about the zero G world and the fact that we've now entered a century in which um, geopolitics is up for grabs. And he recommends that some of our existing institutions have not been developed to assist us uh, multilaterally in addressing the problems we face. So one of his recommendations, which I think is very powerful is a world data organization, rather than having some of our existing institutions, what if we had a multilateral institution or organization that helped us across um, uh, borders, uh, consider the critical um, questions around data as a civil right, as a human right. Um, similarly, when it comes to cybersecurity, we look at, at institutions such as NATO, really not designed to address effectively this uh, multi-border, cross-border um, geopolitical problem. So I think we have to think about how we're going to collaborate, how we're going to work together, and what kind of institutions will help us. But Charles, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm just interrupting. And Charles, didn't you say that EU, European Union, they are making progress? Like, you know, and then they have started understanding this and you know, the value of the collaboration. I agree. I think there are other regions of the world that are probably have the jump on us a little bit, um, oftentimes from perspective. And so certainly when it comes to data and some of the regulations and thinking through data as a civil right, um, you can look to um, what uh, some of the regulations in Europe, you can look to some of the things that New Zealand is doing. Um, but I think that uh, will actually address these problems better together rather than in silos. So I'm a really strong advocate for um, multilateral institutions that are, are perhaps more um, developed for uh, 21st century problems. Okay, thank you so much all the panelists, Maria, Rick, Charla, and Alex for sharing your thoughts and insights with us about this timely and very important topic today. I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with new programs in November. LMU side has organized two programs, one on Hyundai Motors electrification strategy and the other one on digital normal career. Uh, Hyundai and Kia has moved up to number three position in worldwide car sales, thanks to the continued success of introducing eco-friendly cars, including EVs. Please watch our emails and the CBA update to get more detailed information about these events. As you leave this webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a short survey. I would really appreciate it if you can give us a feedback to today's program. Thank you so much, everyone. And good night.